Hi everyone, I'm Ed Baker. Welcome to the Addiction Recovery Channel. I'm your host. Today, uh, we're honored to have three distinguished uh, guests with us, uh, experts in harm reduction and um, experts in caring about people who use drugs. <clears throat> Teresa Vizina is the executive director at Vermont Cares, the state's largest, longest-running AIDS service organization, providing harm reduction services in 11 of the 14 counties here in Vermont. <clears throat> Teresa is a leader in our state, a person with lived and living experience of drug use and proud of it. Her journey away from a life of self-destructive use and chaos began close to 20 years ago. <clears throat> she has devoted her life to working with and for people who use drugs. She has been in the harm reduction field for more than a decade and comes with a deep respect and love of her work. Thank you, Teresa, for being here with us. Thank you for having me, Ed. <clears throat> Joe McGee is a harm reduction advocate and person in recovery, working to break down stigma around addiction and mental health. He is also a Burlington City Councilor, working to bring harm reduction practices into municipal policy making. Thank you, Joe, for being here with us. Thanks for having me, Ed. And Mike Selleck is the Associate Director of Capacity Building at National Harm Reduction Coalition. He has been a community organizer and advocate for human rights, focusing on police accountability, inequality, drug use, sex work, homelessness, HIV, and hepatitis C for more than 15 years. <clears throat> Prior to joining the organization seven years ago, he worked at New York City harm reduction programs, first with a focus on public policy and peer training, and then as director of the services at a South Bronx syringe service program. <clears throat> Mike earned his master's of social work with a concentration in public policy from Columbia University in New York City. Mike is currently based out of Burlington, Vermont. We're lucky to have Mike here. Thank you, Mike, for being with us. You know, I guess what I'd like to do uh, be before we begin our conversation is provide a little backdrop, a little context for our discussion today. <clears throat> Accidental drug overdose in Vermont has more than quadrupled since 2010. Quadrupled. There's been a steady increase in the number of deaths in Vermont every year besides one, 2019. For 2020 and 2021, the rate of increase in overdose mortality in Vermont was over 30% both years. In 2020, we were ranked first in America or worst in America. The rate of increase in Vermont was the highest in America followed by West Virginia and Kentucky. 2021 was the worst year on record with 217 loved Vermonters lost to drug overdose death. This is one Vermonter dead every 40 hours. In Chittenden County, there were 51 deaths, one virtual death every week. At this point, it appears certain that 2022 will be even worse. As of the latest Department of Health statistics, from January through October 2022, there were 190 accidental overdose deaths as compared to 176 for the same period in 2021. We are clearly being overwhelmed. And that's what the show is about today. The show today is about what we're not doing in Vermont. Some would say we have a robust response to drug overdose death in Vermont, and we do compared to other states. But what are we not doing? To that, I'd like to turn to my experts. We have three experts on harm reduction. First, I'd like to have uh, Mike, if you could begin by defining harm reduction. What is harm reduction, and how is it set aside from other traditional types of approaches uh, to drug overdose and drug overdose death. Thanks, Ed. At National Harm Reduction Coalition, we have two definitions, one with the little h, little r, and one with the capital H, capital R. So the more classic little h, little r definition is it's a public health intervention 
that respects the dignity and rights of people who use drugs. We give people syringes, uh, pipes to smoke out of, things to keep them safe from getting uh, soft tissue infections, transmitting viruses, uh, naloxone, things to keep people alive. Um, and that, that's the general concept of it, and that gets adopted by a lot of places. Uh, but with the capital H, capital R, we think of it as a human rights uh, movement to respect the rights of people who use drugs, people who engage in sex work, their autonomy, um, and to really be all about the principles of harm reduction. Um, so we try to really focus on that spirit because you can be a pharmacist who gives a syringe to somebody, but you're not necessarily practicing harm reduction if you are completely mean and disrespectful. Uh, that's why we think it remain harm reduction is best done by people who actually care about people who, drug, who use drugs uh, who practice harm reduction and really use the spirit of it rather than just a simple public health intervention. Uh, people don't build trust with people who are being mean to them. Harm reduction is a trust building tool and an engagement tool. Uh, people's behaviors isn't going to change if we're mean to them and coercion never makes any changes. You know, all, the, all three of my guests today and myself included, we are all members of the Vermont Overdose Prevention Network, and the Vermont Overdose Prevention Network is very focused upon harm reduction. Teresa, for the audience, could you just describe the VOPN and its membership? I'll do my best, Ed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the uh, the Vermont Overdose Prevention Network—that's the—that's uh, what VOPN stands for. For folks that may not know what that um, acronym means, and. Back in uh, 2021, you know, as we really were, Ed was saying earlier, you know, that we were really seeing the rise of um, fatal overdoses, uh, really impacting uh, Vermonters, and felt that it was time to gather up a group of stakeholders, community members um, from all sectors, to really address and look at the opioid overdose death rates and what can we do? How can we advocate for people who use drugs? How can we advocate for better drug policy? How can we as a, as a group of, of individuals and uh, both from the community and from um, within our sectors, our social and public health sectors can come together because um, we all had the same goal and that was just to save lives. Um, and, you know, so as it started out as a grassroots organization, really looking at how can we help through the 2021 legislative session, right, to really highlight overdose prevention sites and ex expansion of syringe service programming and, you know, access to naloxone and all of these things that we know are so important, low, lower barrier buprenorphine programs and, and these types of things. And um, Vermont Cares and myself have, um, been a member of the VOPN uh, since the start, but I've really been able to see that grow mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. Yeah. And the one thing that I really love, and having been in harm reduction now for more than a decade, one of the things that I've noticed, and I think the VOPN is a really great example of, is when I first started doing this work, and many people from decades ago will remember when harm reduction wasn't called harm reduction, it was not well accepted, and we were fighting all of the time. Um, and so I now see people at this table who a decade, two decades ago, yeah. weren't quite there yet. Yeah. And so it's really, really um, heartening and amazing to see the different folks that are at the table now who are genuinely beginning to embrace harm reduction, embrace the um, public health policies that Mike was just talking about, but also really embracing the philosophy of harm reduction and understanding that it is more than the public health interventions and strategies, that it's more than that. And it's just it just brings me a lot of joy. Um, and so we're all working together as a great big team because it takes a village to save lives, really, quite honestly. So um, to me, that's what the VOPN means to me as a member, but I'd love to Mike and Joe to share what their experience has yeah. been. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. A any, do you want to contribute to that? Uh, Comments about the OPN? I think uh, what uh, what Teresa said was exactly right. You know, and it's hardening in the face of uh, a lot of uh, suffering and uh, such a substantial increase in overdose deaths to be uh, working with a group of people that um, understand uh, some of the steps we need to take to begin to save lives and um, to be. Uh, have that space to uh, share in the, the challenges and, and the joy experienced in that work, I, I think is, um, can't be understated how important that is. Thank you. Thank you. 
you know, from, from, from my perspective, the, uh, the wide range of uh, representation is, is um, remarkable. City government, state government, law enforcement, medicine, recovery, harm reduction, people with lived experience. I mean, it, it seems to be very well represented and, and has kind of a momentum to it that, 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 that people like yourselves are, you know, kind of fueling. And uh, I do believe that, um, that Vermont um, will, will be changed, or the way we approach people who use drugs in Vermont will be changed over time. You know, Joe, I think, I think one of the interesting things for us to begin with is um, the, the Burlington City Council's uh, repeated position on, on overdose uh, prevention centers, and then maybe we can go into a discussion of, of that. So do, would you want to begin there, please? <clears throat> sure, yeah. So I, uh, I began working on that resolution uh, with uh, Council President Karen Paul and uh, members of the VOPN. And um, it is very similar to a resolution that was passed by the council, I believe, in 2018, 2020. Um, and this one uses um, more forceful language in terms of um, being explicit in our endorsement of establishing an overdose prevention site in Burlington, uh, because we, we've seen the, the studies that show that um, overdose prevention sites help save lives in uh, exactly the sort of environment that we're seeing in Burlington right now. You can look at a, uh, a map of where we're seeing the most overdoses and fatalities in Burlington and um, see a direct correlation to studies of overdose prevention sites around the world that show that that would be an effective tool for us to implement here um, to help uh, save lives. And uh, so this resolution called for a number of things. It called for the mayor to begin engaging with community partners to uh, figure out what resources are needed to stand up an overdose prevention site in Burlington to make sure that uh, they have the resources that they would need to be successful. Um, and also advocating for the uh, state, um, the settlement advisory committee uh, to dedicate resources to overdose prevention sites as well. Um, and so, you know, I think this was a, a big endorsement from the city council. I think we need to see more action from uh, the state legislature to bring back the bills that were vetoed by the governor uh, last year, um, because you know Burlington can't do this by ourselves. Um, and so I think really having those state partners um, come to the table and recognize that this is something that we need to do and we need to do now uh, is very important. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Mike, I know you've uh, done a lot of research on overdose prevention centers. Um, do, you, do you care to comment on, you know, what exactly happens at an overdose prevention center? You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, Governor Scott, in his veto of H7, AH728, uh, which um, had, put in, had attempted to put in place a study group looking at overdose prevention centers characterized it as uh, in, an injection site. So there's, there's this, a lot of misinformation about what exactly happens. A lot more happens at an overdose prevention center. Would you care to, car to, to comment on that, please? What exactly happens at an overdose prevention center? For the most part, the same thing that happens at any other syringe exchange program in the entire country. When I was running a program, people were regularly injecting in the bathroom, and we called them an unsupervised injection center. We would time people, we would go in and check on people, reverse overdoses in real time. However, an overdose can happen very quickly, especially when we're talking about fentanyl. It can happen in less than a minute, which was not the case with just regular heroin. Um, and what we can do differently in the supervised versus unsupervised is we can give people directions at that moment. Uh, Normally, I'd ask people, please walk me through your injection process to try to help figure out where things are going wrong, especially if people are telling me that they're getting abscesses or other skin infections. I can actually watch a person do it while they're doing it and give them advice in real time, which is much more helpful to prevent endocarditis, uh, which is a bacterial infection of the heart, which is very expensive to take care of, can require a heart transplant months in the hospital, 
um, and it's something we don't talk about nearly as much with uh, drug use. We're often talking about HIV and overdose, which are both bad things that have happened, but there are lots of other outcomes that supervised injection facilities or overdose prevention centers can help to prevent. Um, but really, it's just one service, which is why we like overdose prevention services as a name, because we also are giving out syringes, connecting people to drug treatment, whether that be methadone, buprenorphine, or uh, other kinds of counseling, which is often available there. Uh, we run groups. Um, we have food, showers, laundry, tons of different medical uh, services available or referrals and connections to them. Supervised injections is just one thing we are able to provide in the array of other services. However, it is the one that we can tell you in over 200 facilities in 14 countries for decades across the world, no one has died in one. Not a single person has died in one of these facilities. Uh, it is not the magic bullet that ends overdose across the whole state. Um, it isn't even the magic bullet that would end overdose in Burlington, but it would have a significant impact specifically in the area surrounding it, which is where in our case of Burlington, most of the problems are happening is in the general downtown area. Uh, it's a small enough downtown that one center can probably serve that entire area and people can walk 10 blocks to get to it. Um, so we don't need more research to show this because we know it doesn't increase crime. We know that it reduces the amount of times people are injecting a day. We know nobody's going to die at one. We know they're going to get connected to treatment, to detox, and other services that they need to stabilize their life and stay alive. Uh, basically, when somebody says they oppose this, I would like to hear them always say, and that's why I want to see this person overdose and die in a public bathroom on Church Street. Because that's what they're essentially saying when they're against this. They're not saying that, that this doesn't enable anything. There's no negative consequences. The consequences are people aren't dying at that moment. So they have an opportunity to do something different tomorrow, whether that be engage in healthcare, get onto buprenorphine, or you know keep working towards trying to get housing. Um, but that doesn't happen when people overdose, and that is what people are saying when they're saying they're against this service. I, I couldn't agree more with you, and I think about that a lot. I think it's interesting that you put it that way because sometimes I think about crimes of omission and crimes of commission, and and it seems to be that the mentality is. As long as we don't do something to harm people who are dying of drug overdose, we're safe. But it should be, if we refuse to do something that can save people dying from drug overdose, then we're responsible. It's like a crime of, a blatant crime of omission that the administration in Vermont and the health department in Vermont are not actively seeking and pursuing ways to open an overdose prevention center in Chittenden County, where there's a death a week, a death a week, that and many of them can be prevented. As Joe has said, there's a heat map showing the concentration of death. There's on, superimposed onto that heat map. There's a public transportation system. There's a location. That's ideal. We know everything we know. And, and I want you to comment on this a little bit, um, uh, Mike, if you would begin. The money is available through opioid abatements. There's millions of dollars flowing into the state that are not going into the most efficacious way to save lives now. Do you care to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, we know overdose prevention services save lives. It also saves money, prevents people from needing to call the police on public injecting, prevents people from needing to go to the hospital as much. Um, but the thing is, I, I don't blame people for getting this one wrong. Everything we've learned about drugs was incorrect. I didn't know any of this stuff before I started working in this world. Even when I was using drugs myself, I didn't know any of this stuff to be, be true. We have this weird idea about rock bottom. Rock bottom is dead on the street. We aren't making drugs more harmful is not making anybody recover faster. It's like the idea that if somebody's going to be drinking and we don't give them a glass to drink out of, they're going to stop drinking. That is a ridiculous comment. People are going to drink out of a broken whiskey bottle if that's all they have available. Mm -hmm. So we give them syringes so that they're not injecting with used syringes. All of a sudden, the HIV rates go from huge among people injecting drugs down to basically nothing. It's the same thing here. People think we're enabling drug use. All we're enabling is people to not die on the street. And it's what most people in the community who are complaining about truly want. They say they would like to not see people injecting in public. They say they don't want to have to deal or see these overdoses. This service gets people behind closed doors where they can get support and where nobody in the community has anything to complain about anymore. So it's literally a win-win for everybody. And we see this in places where they've been opened. It takes a few years. Uh, we still see some opposition happening in New York to what's happening in that neighborhood. Um, 
Same thing was happening in Vancouver when that place first opened. Wait a few years, I think it was almost 10 years later when the federal government tried to shut down Insight in Vancouver, the police, the neighborhood, the community, the mayor all came out in support of it. People see how this helps their community. It just takes time for it to really work. You can't decide tomorrow we're going to open the center if magically everyone is going to start using it every single time. It needs to be available for everyone. As far as the money goes, there's plenty of money. I know Vermont doesn't have the biggest budget in the country. We're also one of the smallest states in the country. There's plenty of money through the opioid settlement dollars. And this doesn't have to be set up the way we see in Vancouver or in New York City. It should be similarly sized that's appropriate for people here. We might not have 30 injections happening simultaneously. Maybe we only need a couple boots to make sure people have access to it without having to wait too long. So I don't think looking at a budget for what a center in New York or San Francisco wants to charge is reasonable for looking at what things in Burlington cost when it's a very different town with a very different scale of the problem. But I'm quite confident that with the millions of dollars that are available over the decade plus, we have enough money to get this project started and it should be funded by our government because we're putting money into policing, we're putting money into programs that aren't working for people. Um, and when we put people into course of acid and space programs, they end up coming out overdosing and dying. So we need programs that are supportive for people. Overdose prevention services, syringe access programs, harm reduction increases people engagement in acid and space treatment, and it makes them more likely to stay in it. And it also lets them know that when they exit this, if they're going to use again, we're not mad at them. They should come back and talk to us, get naloxone, and be safe. When people relapse, I want them to come back to an overdose prevention center so that they have a chance to go back to treatment if that's what they choose, not dying because their tolerance is lower and they've internalized the idea that they're only a success if they don't ever use drugs again. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. And this is one of the main um, platforms of the Vermont Overdose Prevention Network uh, this year, is uh, to, to, to see that... Uh, an overdose uh, prevention center is, is open in Vermont. I'd like to switch the focus now to Can number two. I chime in oh one? yeah, sure. Can go ahead. I chime in? I'm sorry. Sure, I'm sorry. I chime in one thing on yeah. the, the overdose prevention site, and uh, just to kind of the way that the way that I kind of look at overdose prevention site is it's just the natural progression of what our existing syringe service program network is mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the the natural next step to the work that we're al already doing and have been doing for decades and doing you know, the best we could with what we had and, and following best practices. And so I just really like what Mike was saying. Like it's, it's an overdose prevention center is everything that happens at a syringe service program. Or we could look at it as it's a syringe service program adding one more service mm -hmm. to, the, to the already existing mm -hmm. uh, expanse programming that we're offering. And so that's why I really think, you know, Safe Recovery has um, all the tools that they need as far as knowing who needs these services right now. They're already working with them. Um, they have already built so many amazing trusting relationships with not only um, people who would be utilizing the service, but with community members, with community partners. Um, so I kind of just want to flip the switch and say, hey, sure. yes, overdose prevention site, but hey, maybe just adding on to our syringe service programming. Sure. Um, so that's just, sorry, that's sure. my no, no, and that's thing exact, I wanted to say. That's exactly where I was going because I wanted to ask you about expanding access to safe syringes, lower barriers to uh, uh, buprenorphine, and uh, measures of that nature, which are also priorities for VOP and that I think you're already involved in. What, what, is, it, what is it about providing of safe syringes to people. I mean, what, 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 what is it about that that fosters health, that, that helps to, to prevent uh, overdose death? My goodness, there's probably so many, there's the obvious, right? It, it um, uh, reduces the risk of transmission of infectious disease, but way beyond that. Um, you know, when I first started at the, well, it was called the needle exchange when I first started working at CARES. And, you know, it was really about getting out those sterile syringes and sterile needles and, and whatnot. And what I've learned and what I've seen, and I always like to put the things I say into terms of stories. Um, and, and, and what I, I learned coming into this work is when someone comes in and they're making this decision to better their health and, and to make this decision to use a sterile syringe by coming to a needle exchange, they're saying so much more than, can I get a sterile syringe, mm -hmm. right? They're, that that action speaks so many more volumes. Um, and then the services that we're able to provide, just the conversations, all, everything yeah. just leads to different pathways to health and, and wellness and to keeping people alive. And it's really determined by that person and what else they're coming in for. They may be coming in to say they need a syringe, but after you sit down and chat for 
you know, 20, 30 minutes, you find out that in addition, you know, they, they also need several other of the things that we're offering. And, and I, I think that is, is also what an overdose prevention site could be like by expanding what you offer it's like you know not just giving out syringes but also you know we're we're giving out supplies for people who use in other ways whether it's you know whether they're smoking which is uh you know we all know is a lower risk of overdose mm -hmm. um if you are used in different ways if you uh, are smoking or maybe if it, snorting instead of you know injecting and so just by offering different supplies to people outside of syringes we, we are also noticing we are connecting with a whole nother group of people who use drugs that we weren't connecting with 20 years ago when the only thing we were giving out was syringes yeah. um, so for me it's about a buffet of options yeah. Um, yeah. and having those doors where people can walk into to get these services be uh, more expansive, right? Because even though I have relationships with the people I serve, another organization who has the capacity to offer harm reduction services, sterile syringes, and other um, uh, services that we know help to save lives, they may also already have an existing relationship mm -hmm. with other folks that we may never have contact with and not be able to build that same relationship with. So I think this expansion of syringe service programming sort of speaks to that. Yeah. But I also have to say um, that I think it's extremely important as we look at that, that the folks that are going to be offering those additional um, services are coming from a true place of harm reduction. I'm, I'm pointing to my heart because sure. harm reduction to me, this is where it starts. And, it, and as long as that's where your start point is, is genuinely loving and caring about people who use drugs and it starts from there, um, you know, I, I fully support um, the expansion of services. Vermont's such a rural state. It is, uh, you, we serve in 11 of the 14 counties, and we have a very uh, small staff to do, to, to, to reach all 11 of those counties. Um, and as you know, it takes at least 20 minutes to get anywhere when you're in Vermont. Um, so having little other spots with scattered throughout the state where these services are available is critical and absolutely can go a long way towards not only saving lives, but just being there for more people. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's all stick with that for a second because I think I heard both um, Joe and, and Mike allude, allude to it, this, this idea of a war on drugs. Um, when, when, when someone comes to you and asks for a syringe and you're, they're asking for much more, when you give them a syringe from the heart, you're giving them much more. Let's, I want to I talk about that a little bit, like this population that's been persecuted, prosecuted, incarcerated, judged, punished, historically for decades. Well, what, what, is it, what is it like when, when, when they come and they're met with compassion or love or a sense of dignity and respect? What's, what's their response to that? I mean, I think it varies, Ed, but I, I, the, the ones, and of course, these are the, th the th the things that kind of stick with you because when someone comes in and they it brings tears to their eyes and they literally will cry and say this is the first time you know I've got gone in somewhere and you know been treated like this and, yeah. and treated like this just means we're just treating them like anybody else the way we would treat anyone else just yeah. with care and kindness yeah. and it just breaks my heart that um, it would bring someone to tears uh, to um, to have this be one of the first times that they're experiencing that in a, as, from a service <laughs> provider. Um, you know, other people are just like really bubbly and really excited and I, I've received so many hugs. We were just talking uh, recently with a, a community partner about when we opened the mobile program in Rutland and uh, that community had been unserved um, for the whole, for all the years that Vermont Cares was and all the syringe service programs, there was no syringe service program in Rutland County. Mm -hmm. um, and Vermont Cares said, well, let's start a pilot. This was back in about 2014, 2015. And the very first people that I saw when I went to Rutland literally came up to me in tears. They were just hugging me so hard and saying, oh my God, we can't believe someone's finally here. We, we've been standing six or seven people deep 
taking turns sharing the same syringe for months. There's no more numbers on the syringe. And, and these um, people were just so genuinely um, grateful, but I also saw the, the distress in them that they had been living this way when services were available two hours away. Yeah. They didn't have services in their community. Yeah. Um, and and um, it, it really, it makes, you, it makes you really stop and think um, when you have, get to have opportunities to really connect with people in that way and see what they really needed yeah. and be able to bring that to them. I think everything that we're talking about on this platform with the VOPN um, supports all of, all of those types of, of things and, and really meeting the needs of people. Um, you don't really know what they are until you start getting out there, really talking with people and seeing how much um, they're struggling, where the, where the gaps are in yeah. service. Yeah. yeah. And, and stigma, stigma and the war on drugs, uh, certainly in our life or in my lifetime since the uh, Nixon administration declared the war on drugs, but certainly before that, I think it was 1915, the Harrison Act prohibited MDs, doctors, from prescribing drugs to patients to provide comfort. The idea being, we're going to make you uncomfortable, and you're going to get so uncomfortable that you're going to be motivated to stop using drugs, not we care about you and we want to help you. And, um, <clears throat> you know, Mike, do you have any, uh, you know, feelings or 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 vignettes uh, about about that in particular. This idea of of people being met where they are and their response to that, as opposed to people being punished and met with stigma and their response to that. I mean, if doctors and nurses were willing to go out to tent cities under bridges at two in the morning to provide public health services, we wouldn't exist. We, we've invented a health system run by people who use drugs and people who love people who use drugs because the medical system and our society is not set up to help people like that. And you see this, like, I, I, I've heard story of people being brought to tears by getting their first syringe from a program. My personal experience has been very different. Um, a lot of times people are not truthful at the beginning, and that is understandable when they've been shamed and stigmatized and internalized that their entire life. They've been kicked out of multiple programs before coming to us. The amount of times people come up to me in the streets and been like, oh, you're giving out needles? Cool, my grandma's diabetic. And I'm like, mm-hmm, your grandma's totally diabetic. And I'll give them whatever they need. And then they walk away and my coworker goes, why'd you give them needles if their grandma's diabetic? I'm like, first of all, we're in a poor neighborhood. If poor people of color need diabetic supplies they can't, supply, can't afford, I'm happy to give them to them. More importantly though, that guy took cookers and ties. There's no way that guy's grandma is diabetic. And he's not ready to talk to me about the fact that he's shooting drugs. But I'm going to tell, I told them I'll be here next week and we can talk next week. Sometimes it takes a month or more for someone to finally go, hey, so I have an abscess on my arm and I don't know what to do about it. Let's talk about my drug use. And that's fine. Um, so I'm sure there are people who like, this is a totally eye-opening moment for them. I personally just haven't experienced it. I've seen way more people who are unwilling to admit that they're using drugs or unwilling to talk about it. Asking people, oh, how often are you injecting was one of the first questions we ask when you come to the program. If they say 20 times and ask me for one syringe, I'm like, see, the math there isn't working out. Can I give you more? The numbers thing that uh, Teresa mentioned, that's so real. I've ever seen so many people pull syringes out of their stock with no numbers on it. And they're like, it's fine, it's fine, I'm still using it. Every time you inject, the needle gets less and less sharp. If you look under a microscope, we give out these pamphlets for years of like, brand new needle, one time injected, five times and it's like a big hook at the end. That's going to cause damage to your veins. It's going to make you more likely to transmit viruses and get pains. When this man wasn't willing to talk to me about his drug use until he had an abscess that he couldn't deal with without talking to somebody. And that's a shame, but that comes from the war on drugs and the state when we're putting people under. They, people are told, don't talk about my drug use. Even if they go to a place where we're trying to give you out materials to use drugs, people are still too scared to talk about their drug use until they've really worked through it and really developed trust with people. So I would often tell our outreach team, look, if somebody wants to come by and talk to you for baseball, about baseball for 10 minutes, talk about baseball for 10 minutes after you give them the needles. That's the conversation that's going to make them say, hey, I'm having this medical problem I'm too scared to ask anybody about. I've been treated poorly by doctors my whole life. Do you know any doctors who will be nice to me? And hopefully the answer is yes, we got them back at the office if you're a well-funded program. But it might be, you know what, I know one doctor, one county over. I could drive you over there. We've had really good experiences, and I'll stay there and hold your hand the entire time. If the medical system was set up to keep, treat people who use drugs properly, 
uh, we wouldn't need to exist in the first place. But unfortunately, it's not. And that's why these services are around. They're mostly run by people who use drugs who didn't do these experiences and just want to care for their community the best they can. Mm -hmm. So so we've discussed overdose prevention centers. We've discussed in, in, uh, increasing uh, access to um, safe syringes. And the, the common theme seems to be <clears throat> connecting and, and engaging people who use drugs in a way that communicates compassion. And, um, you know, and I, and I think that's going to be a theme in every, every uh, topic we discuss. Let's, let's move on to uh, making um, buprenorphine uh, more available by uh, eliminating prior authorization from uh, Medicaid. Uh, what, what about that? Making buprenorphine more available uh, to people why, and making uh, buprenorphine decriminalization permanent. Why is that important? And for, would somebody like to describe buprenorphine for, for the viewing audience? Sure. It's a partial agonist opioid. So it puts some opioids on the receptors, but it has a ceiling effect. Um, that's just kind of technical neuroscience. But the idea here is it's very, very, very difficult to overdose on buprenorphine, making it incredibly safe. Uh, if there was just a new study, I believe, out of Indiana, where they were looking at all the drugs people had on board when they overdosed. And I'm pretty sure in five to 10 years, there was 2.5% of the overdoses had buprenorphine at all. That isn't saying it caused the overdose. That's saying if you're on buprenorphine, you're probably not going to overdose. Um, it is less regulated than methadone and slightly safer than methadone because of the ceiling effect. So essentially, it's the best, easiest to administer medication we have available to us. Um, methadone should be more easily uh, available to people, but unfortunately, there are pretty serious federal uh, rules to how you can dispense it. Uh, as far as buprenorphine, they've actually just reduced the rules. They X the X waiver from the federal government, which means now anyone who's uh, got a training from the DEA to dispense medication can also dispense buprenorphine. Uh, they got rid of the patient caps, so one doctor can now prescribe to as many people as they need. And we need to make buprenorphine easier to get than heroin or fentanyl on the street. We need it to, people want it. It works well for them, and they should be able to access it. When we decriminalized buprenorphine, we did this because we found most people who were giving buprenorphine weren't selling it to make money. They were giving some of their personal usage to their friends so that they could try to avoid withdrawal and protect themselves when they couldn't find drugs. People make risky decisions about sharing syringes, about potentially overdosing. When they're in withdrawal and their risk calculus has changed, you're not feeling well and you want to do anything you can to feel better. And that's when you're more likely to make a mistake and do something that you might not normally think is safe. Buprenorphine helps interrupt that cycle, gives you time, and you can go use that later if you need to, or you can choose never to use again and just stay on buprenorphine because it's giving you what you need to not feel sick all the time while protecting you from overdose. Um, there are multiple different formulations of it. What's working for people is what they should be have available to them. Unfortunately, um, Vermont has structured a deal with a big pharma company in order to get one formulation cheap for Medicaid, which is always a good idea, but has made them unwilling to give affordable buprenorphine to people who use different formulations of it. And that's what this whole uh, prior authorization is about. For private insurance, you don't have to deal with prior authorization, which means the doctor tells you you need it. They send the prescription to the pharmacy. It's there. You pick it up. Prior authorization is another step that is for insurance companies to throttle back care to save money and try to say, oh, you don't need this medication, or maybe you need it, but you should wait a week, or you need it, but I want you to take a different kind of it. And we've already eliminated that for private insurers. But when we tried to eliminate it for uh, public insurance, the governor vetoed it, which is essentially him saying, it's not worth the money to make sure we keep people safe and alive. Um, we need to solve that problem. I will commend the legislature of, Ver of Vermont. We have passed a supervised consumption bill in this state. We have passed a buprenorphine decrim, which is on its verge of sunsetting, we have passed the parity to make sure that there's no prior authorization for buprenorphine. Our problem is the governor who has consistently vetoed these bills um, and the deaths are at his door. It's his fault that people are overdosing when they don't have access to buprenorphine or a safe place to use drugs so that they don't overdose. I think that the studies show that uh, the, the, the death uh, rate drops by 50%. Um, when, when people are prescribed buprenorphine. So half the number of people will die if everyone is uh, prescribed buprenorphine, correct? 50%?
It, it's better in some studies, but it is the gold standard. Methanone and deep are the only thing that cut the death rate in half. I wish I could tell you it was going to cure 95% of people and that nobody was going to die, but there is literally no intervention that we have that is better than buprenorphine or methadone. They are the thing that works the best, that are FDA available. There are other full opioid agonists that people have used around the world and even in the U.S. that are super successful, but the two treatments we have that are FDA approved at this point in time are methadone and buprenorphine, and they are the most effective treatments available for people. It should be the first thing we offer them before counseling, before anything else. I mean, we should offer them syringes and stuff, but when we talk about drug treatment, low threshold buprenorphine, which is happening at the syringe programs and will continue to be happening if we open an overdose prevention center, is the first line treatment. It is the best thing we should be offering people, and there should be zero barriers to it. So when we create artificial barriers, we're making people more likely to be dead and less likely to be in treatment. Thank you, thank you, Mike. I think I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the governor's uh, veto because that was uh, an overdose, uh, a bill focused on overdose uh, responses. And clearly the legislature was, was um, united about it, expressing the will of the population, of the will of the people and the governor vetoed it. It would had uh, it would addressed safe syringe programs, prior authorization guidelines for medication for opioid use disorder, mobile medication assisted treatment, which I think Teresa was, was alluding to a little bit earlier, substance use support for justice involved Vermonters, and o other overdose emergency responses. And the bill was just the will of the people was negated. With that veto, um, maybe we could we could move into this um, substance use support for justice involved Vermonters. Do, do I mean it's my understanding that people who are incarcerated and released from incarceration have like a, an incredibly a high rate of drug overdose death. Is that correct? Anybody who is forced in or has decided to have a short period of abstinence, whether that be from prison, jail, a treatment center, detox bed, has a significantly higher rate of overdose. Um, jail and prison is pretty high on that list, although Vermont is better than some places with connecting people to community-based treatments and initiating treatment while they are incarcerated. Uh, there is still definitely a huge link between coming out of any abstinence-based requirement space into the regular world where overdose happens. Because when your tolerance goes down, which happens only after a few days, uh, the same amount of drugs you use beforehand will cause an overdose. Okay, and that's one of, the, one of the platforms that we need to be looking at is you know, advocating for, for more services for people who are incarcerated or, um, or released uh, uh, from prison. It's one more way to save lives. Teresa, I think that uh, you began to talk a little bit about um, uh, decriminalizing possession of uh, all harm uh, re reduction um, um, paraphernalia. Oh. Could you want you want to um, maybe uh, elaborate on that a little bit? I, you know, I will elaborate on that. I think that the general consensus has been that um, uh, the interventions that the that we use supplies that we're giving out are constantly changing because we're we're going with the flow of like current drug trends, also what, what um, the folks that we're serving are needing. And so right now the paraphernalia law only covers syringes. Um, this paraphernalia law, well, all were great and has been in place for many, 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 many mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, just needs some updating. It just needs a little, little uh, addition to it and that is just to include all harm reduction supplies. This way, whatever the supply is that people are needing, um, harm reduction is, is uh, for us anyway, is led by the by by participants, by people who use drugs. So if people are coming in and say, "Gosh, we really need X, you know, to to stay safe," or we're going to do all we can to make sure that that supply is available to them. And and so I think there's uh, very purposely to keep it broad and open, and to trust that the harm reduction providers in Vermont mm -hmm. are providing the. Um, supplies that people need right now today, no matter what that day is, um, to help to keep them safer, um, whether that be um, 
you know, to reduce infection or reduce um, overdose or, you know, whatever that might be that we're, that we're there to provide that. So we just don't want it to be just syringes, uh, really looking at the expanseness. And we talked about the buffet of options. So we want to make sure that buffet of options is available, but also that people have protection um, as we're looking at, um, you know, the drug checking and different technologies coming out and, you know, just, just to be thoughtful that, um, uh, to create things that, to, that move that, that move along with change, like as change comes and it's, things need to to um, innovate, right? So 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 basically, it looks like you know what, what we're trying to do is keep people alive. It's what we're saying to the public who uses drugs. It's more important for you to stay alive than it is for you to stop using drugs. We'll meet you where you are. We'll help you use drugs safely will help you to stay alive, will protect you from, from using an unregulated drug supply that's contaminated with poison. And while we're doing that, we'll engage you, we'll let you know we love you, we care about you, we understand you, we're studying addiction science so we can better meet your needs because you deserve it, you're worth it. And in the meantime, if we can help you with something else, we'll do our best to do that too. Do you need transportation? You know, do you need a place to live? Do you need clothes? Do you need health care? Do you need help navigating a system that's very complex? Do you need help, you know, feeding your dog or your cat? Do you need a shower? Do you need a haircut? Do you need somebody to talk to? Do you need any, any basic human need met? While we're meeting you where you are, if there's something that you decide you want help with, we'll be there for you. And that's the beginning of a path that could lead anywhere. Certainly in my case and in your case, I know you're in recovery and I'm in recovery, it's led to recovery. You know, uh, this is what it's about. Why, why we're hesitating as we are in Vermont, to really take that final step and embrace harm reduction is, I understand it, but it's unacceptable and it's, it's beyond me. And um, I'd like to go into the last uh, part of the show talking a little bit about the decriminalization of drug possession, because I think this is one of the major factors that drives people into the shadows where they die because they've been criminalized. They're afraid to come out for help because they fear, rightly so, they may be arrested and thrown in jail. So let's talk a little bit about that. Who wants to start on that, Decri the decriminalization of drug possession? And we talked about earlier, jails and prison lead to overdose deaths. So avoiding them is preferable. Um, I believe in bodily autonomy. We could have conversations about how we feel about like drug trafficking, but that's not who we're arresting for drugs ever. We're arresting either people who are using them, which means they're people who are making their own choices about what they do with their bodies. And I personally think that is none of our legislative business. Um, or we're, we're arresting people who sell drugs, which are mostly just people who use drugs, who drugs are expensive. You want to help people who have no money afford them without stealing stuff. They sell drugs to their friends. And then they keep the extra for themselves so that they could get what they need. When we criminalize this, people are less likely to get the support they need in the future. You become ineligible for federal grants for college. Uh, lots of housing becomes unavailable to you. Lots of benefits become unavailable to you. You get background searches when you're looking for simple jobs. You're basically telling people, we want you to change your entire life, and we're going to make it as absolutely challenging as physically possible for you. Because guess what? Most jobs are going to do background checks and not hire you because you got picked up on heroin possession while you were unhoused and using drugs in public. That doesn't really seem like a solution to anything to me. And as you're kind of alluding to, Ed sends the wrong message. It says you're a criminal for using drugs, as mm -hmm. opposed to you're a human being who is using drugs as a, you know, probably maladaptive but coping mechanism. Drug mm -hmm. use is a rational choice in a society that leaves people out. You're homeless and hungry and you have $10 in your pocket and you're cold. Aaron will solve those problems for tonight. No other $10 is getting you housed, fed, yeah. warm, and feeling safe and getting some sleep. So if we can't accept that that's the realities of the society we built, then we're putting sick people in jail 
because they're trying to cope with a sick society. And it's really not the people who are sick. It's the society that's throwing them away like that. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, if I could add to that, uh, Ed, um, you know, I, I think it's important for us to also look at the, the war on drugs disproportionately impacts black communities and communities of color. Um, and here in Vermont, we spend $57,000 a year to keep somebody incarcerated. Mm -hmm. What if we, I think, as a policymaker, what I'm, the question that I'm called to ask is, what if we dedicated those resources towards community care, towards uh, investing in treatment, investing in harm reduction, and uh, helping folks get the support that they need to uh, deal with the trauma that they've experienced in their life? Um, I think, you know, when we start to reframe uh, issues of drug use as uh, public health crises rather than uh, criminalizing uh, possession and use, that's when we start to really get at addressing the root causes that we're, we're seeing, um, investing in, in housing for folks, investing in mental health support, uh, making sure folks have access to health care. So I think everything that we've talked about here yeah. today is uh, is working towards that goal of, of uh, expanding access to just basic health support that folks need that our current system does not provide. Good point. Teresa? Yeah. Um, I just was taking a moment to, to take in what Mike just said, and that is, it is so true. Um, you know, I look at uh, the decriminalization piece you know, has so many layers. Uh, worked, we worked with a student group out of um, uh, Larner College of Medicine at UVM Medical Center, you know, helped us do a, a research project polling Vermonters and physicians, medical providers across Vermont to um, just kind of gauge what their um, readiness was to see decriminalization in Vermont. And the numbers, you know, spoke volumes that, you um, People, not only uh, community members and citizens, but also medical providers, were really ready to see this happen. And my strong belief is as to why is because, because so many people, that stigma that we talk about, like if this were to be decriminalized and you could actually, well before you maybe even had a significant maybe problem where, where whatever drug it was that you're using, whether it be alcohol or heroin or, or crystal meth, or whatever it might be, if... You know, if these things were not decriminalized, if the stigma was removed and we could talk to our, our doctor about it or talk to our, our boss about it or talk to our, you yeah. know, our neighbor about it, if we could just have open conversations, I also think it really falls into that, like, um, that sort of prevention zone that people want to talk about, too. Like, how do we prevent it from getting so far for people? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a real opportunity here in decriminalization uh, to really just be able to have those conversations without so much fear attached to it. You know, I think about my kids, they're in their early 20s and mid 20s, and thank goodness, um, you know, I was able to have open conversations with them, but I've also talked to many families, you know, their kids, it's still, it still is illegal. And when you grow up with something criminalized, um, you know, for, I'm thinking also for our next generations, I have a grandbaby coming, you know, it's like, like how do we want, how do we want our current um, members of society to, to be uh, treated and how do them to feel, but also what do we want for the generations to come? And um, I think this could have far-reaching um, effects in, on in, on so many levels. And so the the what we learned from our study was that more people would feel comfortable from a public health point uh, to talk to their um, medical providers if it if if it were decriminalized. Mm -hmm. Um, hopefully then fending off any particular uh, life-threatening issues sooner. I hear you, and thank you. And thank you for that study. That's, that's important. I hope we can help to, to publicize that information. <clears throat> we're, we're just about out of time. I uh, thank you. I thank you all for your expertise, your work, uh, your generosity in, in coming to the show and sharing your experience. Um, I wanted to give everybody just uh, like, a, like a, a, a brief opportunity to speak to people, speak directly to people using drugs. What do you have to say to people using drugs? Um, maybe, Teresa, would you like to begin that? Um, gosh, Ed, what would I say to people using drugs? Like, I, I'm a person that uses drugs, so also what would I say to myself? Um, you know, I, I just think it's 
just be yourself. You know, it, it's, it's actually just okay because we are so much more than people who use drugs. Like, I don't even know that I even like that label anymore, right? It's like, we're actually just people, right? A person that might choose to do drugs or not choose to do drugs or choose to drink or not drink or choose to watch Netflix or not watch Netflix or choose to shop or not shop. We're all just people first. And I guess that's what I would say. We're all people first. And the activities we engage in, the behaviors that we um, take part in, all that stuff is a piece of who we are, mm -hmm. but it's just a piece. And and we have the choice every single day, every single moment to choose something different. Um, I, I personally have always, you know, uh, been an everyday glass of wine drinker. I've, I've a few months ago saw that, hey, you know what? I'm going to choose. I'm not going to be drinking wine every day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean anything particular. It just means that I chose something different. And I think, you know, we just all have that opportunity. Ed, we're all people. And we're all people that deserve to have our own our own choice, like not to have that, our choices taken away from us. Um, also as a woman with everything that's just happened, like like our bodies are our bodies and what we choose to do with them and put into them, um, it should always be our choices and we should never be judged for those choices. Thank you, never be judged, thank you. Um, Mike. About 10 years ago when I still worked in services, I made a series of pamphlets uh, that we gave out in our program, Safer Sex Work, Safer Drug Use, Overdose Prevention. They all said different things on the front, but every single one of them said, you matter. So I want that to be the message that people who use drugs always hear from us. Uh, the whole world tries to tell people they don't matter. People internalize that stigma and start to feel like they're worthless. Uh, that makes people use drugs more. If you think you're worthless, you don't feel like doing anything different, you're just going to keep using drugs. So I hope everybody who uses drugs knows you matter. There are people in the state who care about you. There are programs here who can treat you with that kind of respect and dignity and help you understand that you're not a bad person just because of your drug use. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what we all need to do is to stop making people feel bad about themselves. The more we do, the more people will use drugs. Not just people who use drugs, but people who use drugs in particular. Let's just try to be nicer to each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe. <clears throat> well, Mike and Teresa, I think, uh, it said most of what I, I would say, I think I'll just close it out by saying simply, you know, you are loved, you have value to our community, and your story matters. Um, as a policymaker, uh, folks with lived experience sharing stories about how uh, our systems have failed uh, is how we begin to make them work better for folks. And so I would just uh, encourage folks, if they feel comfortable, if they're, if they're able to share their story. Um, and myself for um, find a way to have your voice heard. Thank you. Thank you. That's it uh, for, for this show. I want to thank the three of you for joining me today, for, for coming on to the Addiction Recovery uh, Channel. For, for the viewing audience, for the general public, um, you know, <clears throat> we're in this together, and we are being overwhelmed by it. Uh, as a culture, as a state, as a society, as a group of communities, uh, we're back on our heels. And um, we need to, to really search ourselves, search ourselves and figure out what, what is it that each one of us can do as an individual first to be compassionate toward people who use drugs or develop problems as a result of using drugs, to communicate to them, to actively communicate to them that we love you, you're okay, just the way you are. And secondly, I do believe this, that this is a democratic society. We vote and we have influence with our votes. We have voices and we have influence with our voices. We need to research people running for a state senate. Research people running for the House of Representatives. Research people running for local positions, people running for the governor, the gubernatorial position. We need to research that. And we need to vote for people that are in line with our values. And if we care about people, and we care about people who use drugs, we can find out what people running for positions of power think 
along those lines and vote for the ones that we identify with. We can also, if we're dissatisfied with the way someone is uh, behaving or the decisions that they're making, we can, we can protest. We can call them. We can write emails. We can write commentaries, letters to the editor. We can be more vocal about this. I know everyone is overwhelmed with life, life itself. We're all struggling to meet the demands we meet every day. But each one of us, each one of us can make a little bit of a difference, and that can make a very big difference. And we need to make a very big difference in what is happening in Vermont. So, so thank you, and I'll look forward to seeing you next time.